So basically, this is a project management class. And so I'm giving you a presentation that I gave to DBIA yesterday. Well, I didn't really give it. This lady came on right before I gave it. And she took my presentation off and she put an older one that I'd sent her like a month ago on. By the time I realized it wasn't the same one, I was halfway through. Anyway, but you got the updated ones, so I, don't, I didn't waste my time. OK, the first thing in these classes is you never take anything personally. OK, so like if we say something like, we're, we'll always use extremes. And we'll make it so simple that you know, it's very hard to mistake what we're saying. For example, if this is a very fast processing person who understands reality, and this one is a very slow processing person who can't understand reality, which one is more likely to get into more accidents? This one. Which one is more likely to be born in the dark ages? If one is the oldest and one is the youngest child, which one is more likely to be the oldest? Wow. The oldest child versus the youngest child. Okay. Which one has more expectations? Which one has parents who don't quite understand reality yet? They barely know what they're doing being married to each other. Which one gets more rules? Which one gets more stress? Which one gets more abused? Which one is more likely to understand reality better? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We have a disconnect here. OK, look, we're talking about the oldest child, right? OK, so the oldest child is more likely to be this one or this one? OK, which one gets more expectations? Oldest or youngest? OK, which is this one or this one? OK, look, look, look. This is the fast processor. This is the slower processor. How many of you believe that fast processors have an easier life? OK, wait a minute. See, this is what you're going to learn in this class and some of the other classes. You have to realize who you are. Okay, look. Fast processor, slow processor. Which one is more likely to be born in the dark ages? Wait a minute. You all know history, right? What kind of people did we have during the dark ages? The fast processors or slow processors? Slow. Which one is more likely to be born in a country that has no resources and no opportunity for education? Fast processor or slow processor? Which one has a harder life? Oldest or youngest? Who has the harder life? Which one is more spoiled, the oldest or the youngest? Everything is unique. But what I'm proposing to you, what I'm proposing to you is there are natural laws in place. And if you begin to observe natural law, you begin to see your strengths and weaknesses based on who you are. But I can guarantee you, right, because I have eight kids, I guarantee you that the youngest in my family had a much better life than the oldest. I'll tell you, I abused the oldest one more than the youngest one. I bet you, if my wife was totally honest with you, she'd tell you she loves the youngest one more. <laughs> Do you think I'm telling you the truth? This is reality. 
Okay, I don't care what culture, developed country, underdeveloped country, I don't care what time it is, natural laws govern everything. If you can accept what you see and accept natural laws, you're going to learn a whole lot more than if you have your own bias, right, on what you think is right and what you think is wrong. And in this class, if you've never heard this before, your life is like this. By the time you leave this, it's going to be like this. Why? Because most people in this world are visionary or blind. Blind. They're blind. They don't know what's going on in reality. They don't know how to solve problems. They don't know what causes problems. And this course of project management, I mean, this is the best place really to start learning this stuff. Okay? But don't take anything personally. If you're the oldest kid, you now know that you don't have the choices spot. Simply because if you had a younger sibling and your parents actually learned from their experience with you, their experience is going to be better or worse. But for you, I'm going to propose, you had to be born where you were born. Okay? So it's not good or bad. Okay. I don't really know any of you. This is a change of paradigm. So when you think I'm talking about you, because as I start talking about my experiences, a lot of students start thinking about themselves. But I don't know who you are, so just you know, don't take it personally. Just try to just think like I know somebody else sitting next to you and I'm talking about them so you can relax, right? You really have to have a very free mind in this class or else you're not going to learn very easily or quickly. Okay, we'll start off with the industry structure chart. I created this in 1991 and it's changed very little. In fact, we thought it was only the construction industry. We learned that every industry is structured the same way. And it's based on logic, common sense, and what you see. And what we're looking at here is we're looking at performance and competition. Oh, this is on your cheat sheet. This you should see in your sleep, right? Because it's so dominant and significant. Now, all the owners who buy want to be on the right-hand side of this chart, right? Okay, they want high competition because they think it drives the what down? Price. But we have identified that the difference between low performance and high performance is simply with low performance, somebody's telling somebody else what to do. That's it. Now, out there in the industry, so many people think project managers have to tell other people what to do. That is the traditional model. So when this is going on, right? If this is an expert vendor, the value of their expertise goes up or down when somebody's doing this to them. Down. down. Right? Do they become more proactive or reactive? Can these people, the buyers, utilize their expertise? They're too busy talking. Did you run through the rules in this class? Okay, but the significant rule is you cannot have your electronics on in this class. Okay, that's the only rule. After that, you can do almost anything, but you can't have your electronics on, any type of electronics, right? Okay, <laughs> now, if somebody's doing this to somebody else, do you think they're more expert or less expert? Less. So they act, they're actually hiring somebody who doesn't know what they're doing. Now, why would somebody hire somebody else who doesn't know what they're doing?
They just think that they can actually control and influence the other party. And it's flat out wrong. Right? And they're delivering services in every industry like this. This side's telling that side what to do. Who should know how to do the job better? The expert. And therefore, these guys are abusing and raping the industry of all the capability. So I'm presenting at DBIA, Design Build of America, yesterday, and an elderly guy comes up to me and he says, you know, Dr. Dean, there's not a lot of expertise left in our industry. I said, I know that. All right? And it's caused by this. All right. Now, this is a supply chain. This is two individuals who are in different companies, a buyer and a vendor. This is in an organization. Is this a good thing? What is this called? Micromanagement. Micromanagement. Is this a good thing, where the experts and workers flow information to the boss? OK. If the workers and experts flow information to the boss, does the boss have to think more or think less? Wait a minute. Who said think less? Why would you think less if information is flowing to you? Okay, look, if you're in the beach at Waikiki in Hawaii and there's nobody else there on the whole beach and you're lying on this beach chair, this lounge chair, and when you go like this, there's somebody behind you who will put a drink in your hand. So when you go like here, you get the drink and you're drinking the drink. There's no temperature. What does no temperature mean? You can't tell if it's hot or cold. That's what we mean, no temperature. Nobody else is there. It's like super gorgeous. Are you going to start thinking about what are the five biggest problems I have in my office? <laughs> are you going to be thinking more or thinking less? OK, look. <laughs> simple. I'm going to run a simple test. I'm going to drop this or release this 100 times. What percent of the times is the bottle going to remain right there in my hand? But I haven't run the test yet. But you know that, right? Do you have to think more about this or less about this? Yeah. So when it's simple, do you understand it or not understand it? You understand it. So when you don't understand it, and it's not simple, do you think more or think less? When somebody's flowing information to you, right, does that mean you knew more or knew less about it? You knew less, because if you actually understood it, you'd tell them, shut your mouth, don't talk to me, I already know what's going on. Do you ever, have you ever seen like gnats in your ear and they're like going like this all the time to you? They're what we call irritating. They're like, get away from me. Right? If you're ever the boss and you got people doing this to you all the time and it forces you to think, I guarantee you this is not a good thing. And I guarantee you have to think more. When you have to think more, you don't know what's going on. And whenever somebody's flowing your information and you have to think about it, sooner or later you're going to have to make a what? Decision. And then you're going to have to tell them what to do. The only people who can't figure out what's going on are the people who can't see into the future. They don't realize when that starts doing, sooner or later they're going to have to do what? So this always leads to this. It's a natural law. Does that make sense? It is a natural law. 
which means if it's this, it's not good. If it's this, it's not good. If somebody makes you think, it forces decision making, your stress level as the boss is going to go which way? And your risk is going to go what? So thinking is not a good thing. Thinking tells me that you understand more of what I'm saying or less. So if I'm a good teacher, you'd be totally relaxed. You wouldn't have to think because I'll present it so simple. If I make it complex, that means you have to think about it, which means I'm trying to abuse you. Which means, am I more of an expert or less of an expert? Less. Now, these are all natural laws. But the reason why I got you kind of perplexed is because you've never thought about this logically. See, in your experience, in your culture, right, thinking was a good thing. Making decisions was a good thing. Doing this was a good thing. Look, I have two very experienced partners working together versus two very inexperienced partners. Which one does more of this, the experienced or the inexperienced? It's a natural law. When people don't know what's going on, they immediately start talking. They can't control it. Does that make sense? So whether it's this from the owner or this from a boss or this from the workers or this or because that's not good, that's not good, this, this, any form of this is what? It identifies people who don't know what's going on. Number one thing. So, in countries where they have a lot of meetings, do they have more expertise or less expertise? Yeah. Less. First thing you have to realize, if you're smart, you realize you have no control over somebody else. People go, how could that be? Right? Owners tell me, we have a contract with this vendor. They have to do what we tell them. So I ask them a couple simple questions. If you have to read your contract, is that a good project or a bad project? It's bad. Immediately, they have to call their lawyer. Once they have to call their lawyer, do you think they go home that night more happy and contented and like totally grateful that the lawyer came in? Or do you think they're now more on edge? The contract does nothing. It gives no control. It causes stress levels to go up. People don't even read the contract. If people are finally begin to realize the contract offers you nothing. And the only thing that should be in the contract is something that minimizes stress and risk. And therefore, who should be writing the contract? The people know what they're doing. But there's no way to control somebody else. No way to tell them what to do. And there's no way to make any assumption with any degree of accuracy of what they understand and then what they're going to do once they, you think they understand. This is Project Management 101. If you don't understand this, you're going to be lost. You're going to actually think you have influence, you have control, you can tell somebody what to do, you can actually deliver a project, that this is something that like, will add to your repertoire. All right? And the answer is, it's all wrong. Okay. Any questions on this? Now, do most educators teach this? They don't teach what I'm teaching. What do they teach you? Management, direction, and control. Why? Because most people are blind. So some instructors are also blind. So the blind teach the blind, and those blind become instructors. They teach other blind people. That is why this has gone on for how many years? Like forever. I've been in this, around this business like for 40 years. We have the same problems we had 40 years ago. Because people are blind. Okay. And therefore, the only difference between high performance and low performance is low performance, somebody's trying to tell somebody else what to do. And high performance is, 
where we utilize expertise. Now, people cannot understand how ill this environment is. It's like the land of the blind. It's like nothing can go right, and this is why. When people are blind, do they understand what's going on in reality? No. Do they understand other human beings? No. Do they believe in magic? Yes, they believe in magic. So if I run a test 99 times, and 99 times the bottle falls, only an engineer will tell me on the 100th time it could go up. Only an engineer, <laughs> right? And they think they're really like being creative. I can tell you 20 years apart, I've heard the same answer. Some engineer in the audience tells me, well, Dr. Dean, you actually have a jet in engine under the table, and you're going to flick the engine on, and when you release it, the bottle's going to fly out. And I heard the same quote 20 years apart. And only an engineer would say that. Why? Because engineers are taught to work with details. Am I correct? Equations and details. Oh, you got to hit this. Yeah. So how can you picture this so you'll never forget it? Simple. When somebody learns by details, do they step away from problems and understand what's going on? No. Their solution is to what? Go into the details. So this is an engineer. So when they have to do a new job, they do this. <laughs> they look at it. Are the details the same or different? They're never the same. They're different. So an engineer sees the different details, and they start all over again. And they never realized if they lifted their head off the table that the two are very similar. And the only difference between the two is something very simple. Therefore, engineers traditionally never learn from experience. The way engineers are hired, the way engineers work, they always start as if from the beginning and they try to apply their engineering principles to solve a problem. That is a traditional engineer. That's how engineers are taught. And I've worked with them out there in industry, and they're totally blind. They're our biggest obstacle because they're always into details. They can't step away from the situation. So today's engineers have to be totally different than the traditional engineer. Now, what goes on when somebody tells somebody else what to do because they're blind and they don't understand what's going on? What goes on is, do you think they have more fear or less fear of all the other people? More. When somebody has fear, the first thing that enters their mind is what? Somebody's going to cheat me. So their biggest concern is, I don't want to be cheated. So what do they do? They identify the bare minimum acceptable so that if it's below this line, they don't have to pay for it. But they don't even understand that when you try to describe what the minimum is, it's subjective. It's made up. And then what happens is they really want something that's higher value, right? But all the vendors, right, they come, right? And they realize what an engineer is. He wants the lowest price. And how much credibility do they have for their expertise? None. So they quickly turn that minimum into a maximum, and they drive it the other way. And this has been going on in the world, in every industry, since the beginning of time. Everybody's thinking only of who? Themselves. And all the efforts of the engineers now are to make sure that when this is driven down, that they can actually control it so that it doesn't go down that much. 
But I can tell you, and even in this class, you're going to get information that tells you that these minimums, these standards are all made up. They have actually no meaning. It's all subjective. And most engineers never get taught that. They don't even know how they're created. They have nothing to do with performance. And that is why everybody in their head now is thinking high value, high performance, or minimums. What is everybody thinking about? What can I do the least that I can do and get away with this? Now, when you have people all thinking in terms of minimums and what is the least I can do, are you going to get like higher performance or lower performance over time? Yeah, and that's what's been going on for like 100 years. And this happens in every country. This happens in every culture. This happens in every industry. It's exactly the same thing. Any questions about this? OK, now later on, they're going to get into more details and show you this is actually going on. Okay. I don't even know if Albert Einstein said this. Okay, but you know, we put his face there. It's like, this is all marketing. Okay. But we can't get a different result if we do the exact same thing. So what is needed? We need a paradigm shift. We need to understand logic and reality and common sense. Thinking, decision making, influence, and management direction and co control all increase risk and increase cost. Any questions on this? If you have to think more, you're in trouble. Right? Don't think you're going to get to the better answer if you have to think more. Just remember, right? The real smart, high processing, understands reality, and this guy doesn't understand anything. Which one is more likely to get confused? Which one is more likely to do any type of thinking? You got it. Yeah, isn't this a different paradigm? Huh? So what do we want to introduce? We want to introduce the project management function as replacing management direction and control with the utilization of expertise. It took me a long time to figure this out. You hire an expert, right, who can see from beginning to end of what he's doing versus somebody who doesn't understand anything of what's going to happen. Which one will always be able to deliver it at a lower price? The expert. Such a simple concept. That is why we hire people who know what they're doing. And the more we do this, the more we find what type of vendors? It allows people who don't even know what they're doing. Amazing. And then these guys, right, they end up talking more or less once they hire this vendor who has no expertise. More. And then the performance goes what? Lower. And then what do these people do? They blame this guy. Anybody come from Africa? Oh, boy. You know, my heart's out to you. I <laughs> I've been in different places in Africa. If they would just take all the money that they're supposed to receive from the World Bank and everybody else and outsource and bring experts in to build power plants, infrastructure, instead of letting people tell them to manage, direct, and control somebody else, they'd be so far ahead. Right. Instead, they're all worried about, we got all these millions of dollars. We have to build power plants and dams and everything else. But we're going to make sure that we tell whoever does it every little detail and make sure that they don't cheat us and give us the lowest possible price. All the projects finish when? Many of them never finish. If you want to know how bad it is, if you go into the Demo Democratic Republic of the Congo and you arrive at the airport 
and you go to the middle of the city where they have some nice hotels that you can actually stay at and be safe at. It's a one hour drive and there's only three things that use electrical power. There are three traffic lights and they're all powered by solar power. Less than 9% of all people in the DRC have access to electrical power. It is so sad, right? And it's because they don't learn the simple concepts of how to utilize resources. And it's really not their fault. They're actually mentored by the people who come in and tell everybody to do this, right? Who is the World Bank and the experts at doing this, the Brits. See, the Brits, are, they, they spread the poison over the whole world. Manage, direct, and control. So I can tell you that over 50% of all people in Africa, if they could identify what their premier job would be for the rest of their life, it is to do what? Isn't this true? They want to be a manager so they can tell somebody else what to do. It's an amazing thing. We want to utilize expertise. The best value are experts will always deliver the lowest price, always. And this is never a legal issue. We hear this all the time, well, it's a legal issue. No, it's not. When somebody says it's a legal issue, they just don't want to do it, so they say, oh, we have laws. It can always be done. We've been doing this for over 20 years. It's been amazing. We are the only group that have changed a country. We have changed our own university and how they deliver services. We have been issued more licenses at Arizona State than any other research group. We are worldwide, we are the expert. If anybody wants to learn this, they come to us. Nobody knows this better than we do. We've been in 31 states, and we've been in six different countries, so five others than the United States. More information. Our biggest client is Arizona State University. They actually came and allowed a professor to change their whole procurement and delivery service and to do it on something we had no knowledge whatsoever about. We did it on food services. Ten years, $400 million worth of food. We actually wrote the RFP. We ran through the selection process, helped them select who they wanted to select, and they ended up getting $32 million from the vendor most of it in the first three years because it would allow the vendor to utilize their own expertise. And since that time, they have bought more than $1.7 billion worth of services. We received an award from our work at Harvard. We had the National Science Foundation actually degrade our, our office and its research efforts. They said, these people don't know what has value, they don't know how to do research, we don't know why Harvard wants to participate with them. We went back to Harvard and told them what the National Science Foundation had told us. And they said, well, we'll go ahead and do it anyway. That year, we did, I believe, five tests. The results were staggering. Best they'd ever seen. It went so well that we had Cornet Global which is a professional real estate organization, issue us the Innovation of the Year Award for that year. We've been written up in ENR. We've got other awards. But the greatest achievement we ever had was in the country of the Netherlands. They were having collusion. The turn of the year 2000, they were already in collusion. Very early on, the government understood what was going on and what these vendors were doing. They would all get together. They would decide ahead of time who would get the job. 
everybody else would bid higher. And this collusion took place from the general contractors to all the major subcontractors and all the material suppliers. And nobody knew what to do about it. So finally, it was a police action. Finally, what happened was the police raided everyone, found out it was true, and now they wanted to find out who organized the whole thing. They wanted to throw people in jail. So they first wanted to find each participant 10% of their turnover. Turnover being how much their contract was, right? So if they had a $10 million contract, they would have to pay a million in fines. The only problem is all the vendors were only making less than 2% profit. So if they were fined 10%, all of them would go into bankruptcy. Nobody could do any of the construction work. Then all the other contractors from the rest of Europe would come in, would do the work, and take the money where? Back to their own country. So they quickly realized they couldn't do this. So then what they did was the traditional human behavior. They tried to find the ringleader who organized the whole thing. And they told everybody else, if you testify against him, you're clean. And we can send him to prison. Right? Find a scapegoat. Right? But even after they did that, and there was no doubt that there was collusion. So one of the contractors, who was the first one who brought me in, actually took me to the castle. The group had bought a castle. And in the castle, they were doing all their boards, their reviews, their protests, hearings, everything. And he goes, look at, look at what, what we had. And, and we did all our business in here. And I said, so do you think it was a good thing or a bad thing? He said it was an outstanding thing to do. I said, what do you mean? He said, because we were actually cooperating, and whatever, whenever one vendor had a good idea, everybody got the idea. We were all cooperating with each other. I said, wow, that's an interesting perception. Then I began to realize what caused collusion. What was it? It was when the client does this, and it gets to the point where this side has to keep bidding lower and lower, and they're doing more and more of this, and the profit margins go what? Down to nothing. They couldn't survive. It was only because the owners were doing this that caused the whole thing. It had nothing to do with the vendors. It was not intentional. It was for survival that they had to collude. And nobody understood this, so their solution was, we're going to do even more of this. But a, a visionary had heard me speak, brought me in. One of the vendors who sent their people into the meetings, and there's only one vendor who did this, that visionary showed up at Arizona State University. And the next year where we had our annual meeting, he listened to it. He said, this has got to be the only way out. Then we found more visionaries. We found a professor who heard it and said, this is the answer to all supply chain problems. And before you know it, we had our first test. It was in the Netherlands for infrastructure repair, road widening, $1 billion. And they had no way to do it because they didn't know how to optimize and speed up the delivery. What they were asking to be done in four years actually took them 12 years. They couldn't do it. So as a last resort, the visionaries came to ASU and said, we're going to take your process, we're going to modify it for European law, and we're going to run our first big test, a billion dollars worth of infrastructure repair. Now what happened? This is the new project management model, right? How much of this? None. None. Totally cut that out. In the selection process, they come in and they identify why they can do the job, and they're just picked. Then they tell the client how they're going to do it. Then they go out and do the work. So what happened? Different culture, something totally new. Instead of finishing 10 projects, they finished 15. They cut off 50% of all procurement transactions. 
the construction delivery time was sped up by 25% on average. And they identified and confirmed that all the problems were being caused by who? This was so significant. So what happened? The Dutch Professional Procurement Group came to Arizona State, licensed everything we do, and started teaching and certifying every procurement professional in how to do this. This moved to the risk managers, the project managers, and the professional engineering groups. Significant. In five years, this has become the preferred model. Do this what? Less. So let's look at observations of what currently happens. People make us work harder. They make us think more. They stress us out. Then they tell us it's good for your professionalism. Right? This leads to a happy and a good life. Right? They increase transactions. They communicate complex ideas that really tell us that people don't know what's going on. And it proliferates the make it complex practice. So that's why people come to the university to learn project management. So they can talk in very complex terms. And I just heard some guys get up and talk at the conference. It blows me away. I can't believe. In fact, my head starts hurting. I have to leave the room because I can't stand it. Who would do this to somebody else? Only the blind. No, the owner must minimize decision making. We have to have a structure that people become smart. And the vendors are the true experts. So what do I tell vendors? If you're responding to an owner who wants to utilize expertise, don't make them think, don't make them make decisions. You keep it simple. And if you don't, they've already been taught that the only people who don't keep things simple and walk them through in the future are non-experts that you're going to lose anyway. So don't send stupid people. The bottom line. Right. And so we do things that are so simple in this process, it's amazing. 